NIV, ESV, KJV, 4K, CBS, what is this? Why are there 50 million Bible translations? And which one should I read? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? If so, you are in luck because that is the topic we're going to cover in this video. Hey guys, Jeff here from That Bold Life, your weekly encouragement to help you live a bold life for Jesus. If you're watching this shortly after it aired, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did. I ate way, way too much and regretted it. If you're watching this now, I'm back on my low carb diet, so wish me luck getting back into that after the holidays. At the end of this video, I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the top Bible translations. I'll be reading John 3, 16 through 21, which is an incredibly popular passage, in several of the top translations so you can decide for yourself which translation you prefer. If you'd like to skip forward to that, I will have time codes down in the description for everything that's going to be kind of happening in this video. You can skip around if you'd like, but I recommend you stay to the end of the video because I guarantee you are going to learn something. I know once I became a Christian, I really wanted to begin reading the Bible and understanding the Bible and just digging deep into the Word of God. And my first initial question was, okay, which one should I read? And I actually have the first Bible I started out with. It is a small King James Version Bible. Uh, this is one of the first Bibles that I picked up and I began reading and I loved it. I still love this Bible. I want to preface this video by saying this will not be a Bible translation bashing session. I will not be trashing any Bible translations. I believe we have a lot of wonderful translations that many hours of work went into giving you the most accurate representation of God's Word. So I'm not going to trash any particular translation. I will tell you that even though I love the King James Version, I had a very difficult time understanding what it said. And I believe a lot of you will probably agree with me that it's not always, if you didn't grow up in church, if you're like me and you became a Christian later on in life, this isn't always the easiest version to understand. And I'll completely agree with you on that one. I later moved on to this Bible, which I talked a little bit about last week, which was my Teen Guys Study Bible. It is NIV translation. And I loved it. And I actually found myself reading both of these from time to time. I always said I'd love to have a parallel of the two, and they make those, and I should probably just get one. But I love to read King James. I love to read NIV. Now my current Bible is this right here. It is the Jesus-centered Bible. It, the whole Bible is about Jesus. I love this Bible, and it is an NLT. I've bounced around from translation to translation. I am now reading this one. This is one that was just sent to me by Holman. It is the Christian Standard Bible. It is a brand new 2017 translation, and I was sent it for free to do a review of it. And if you would like to see the review of this translation on this channel, leave me a comment down below and let me know. But I've been reading through it, and I've actually really been enjoying it. This is a, a really great translation. Um, it is closer to a word for word, which we will talk some more about if you're not familiar with that phrase. In this video, I'll be specifically talking about our English Bible translations, as I am not familiar and cannot speak to other translations of the Bible. So I will be speaking to the English translations only. So we're going to ask the question, why do we need so many different English translations? Just in this room alone, I have six different translations in print. If I opened up my Bible app on my phone, I would have access to over 50 English translations. Why do we need so many? All right, so to start off, why do we need a translation of the Bible anyway? Why can we not just read the original things that were written down by the original authors? Unless you've been to seminary and you're fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, you're not going to be able to read the original languages because they were written many, many years ago in different languages. The original manuscripts were mostly composed of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. So we need that language translated into English for us to be able to read it. Now, why do we have so many different English translations? Well, linguists say that the English language has changed more in the past 400 years than Greek had in 2,000 years. You see, our language, English, is constantly changing. Our phrases, our terminology, the words we use, the statements we make, they change and they mean something generation to generation. Think about what words like, you know, lit and dude and fleek, you know, would have meant just five years ago, completely something different. As we can see, just in that example, our language is changing. And as a youth pastor, most of the time, I have no idea what my teenagers are saying anymore because the English language is changing, it's adapting. So as that goes, we need 
newer translations. We need different translations so that we can more accurately understand what the Bible actually says. Now in doing so, we essentially have what I'm going to talk about the two main types of translations. So we have literal or known as word for word, and we have a paraphrase or thought for thought. Some thought for thought versions you're probably familiar with, of course, are the New International Version, the New Living Translation, and several of the new translations are technically thought for thought. So a couple word for word translations you might have heard of, of course, is the King James Version and the New King James Version, as well as the American Standard Version and the English Standard Version, which is a fantastic translation. In a word for word translation, they'll look at the original manuscript, whether it's the Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, they'll look at the original language and they'll try to match the word for the word. So the for the, passage for passage, you know, they'll match word for word so that it exactly lines up. So if there's 10 words in Greek, they'll try to match that with 10 words in English and they'll try to match word for word for word. And sometimes in these word for word studies, you'll notice that the sentence structure is a little bit messed up in our English language. It sounds a little bit strained. For example, we read in Romans 15, 28 in the King James version, which the King James is a word for word. They try to match the Greek word to the English word. They try to match it word for word. In Romans 15, 28 in the King James version, it says this, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. You notice how it just, it feels a little bit strained in English. It doesn't, you don't typically in an English sentence, you wouldn't say, when therefore, or you wouldn't say, I will come by you into Spain. That's not exactly how you would word it, but that's how the sentence structure was in the original language. So they matched it word for word. Whereas in a thought for thought, which I'll read to you out of the NLT, that same verse would say this. As soon as I have delivered this money and completed this good deed of theirs, I will come to see you on my way to Spain. And that sounds a lot more natural to the way we understand it. Now note, this does not match word for word. It matches thought for thought, right? It's not the exact words they used, but it's the thoughts they intended. It's, it's what they were trying to say, but they structured it into a easier to understand English passage. Now, I'm not saying either way is better than the other, or either way is gonna be more accurate than the other. I'm just saying that a word for words can sometimes feel strained, like the King James Version or the American Standard Version. They can feel a little bit strained because they're trying to make English sentence forms fit Greek sentence forms, and it doesn't always line up quite right. Doesn't mean you can't understand it. Doesn't mean it isn't accurate. Just doesn't always line up quite right. So your thought for thought will typically be a little bit easier to understand. Now, the idea is that our thought for thoughts will match the thoughts of the original authors. That doesn't always mean they're as accurate as a word for word. A word for word will match exactly the words that were used in the original language. So you can know that it is accurate. However, a thought for thought leaves a little bit of room for interpretation in certain parts. So you may lose a little bit of accuracy. In my personal experience and in my non-expert opinion, I've read several Bible translations, usually side by side. Whenever I'm preparing a message, I'll read the passage I'm gonna be studying or preaching on. I'll read it several times in different translations to get an accurate representation of what's going on. And in my experience, the Bible translations may say it differently, it may sound totally different, but the meaning, the purpose, the thought, and the theology are all the same. So the question is, which one should you be reading? Now, I cannot endorse Bibles used by cult-like sects like the New World Bible or the Book of Mormon as used by the Jehovah's Witness and the Church of Latter-day Saints. But I do believe that at least the top English Bible translations are extremely accurate. I believe that you can get an accurate representation of God, of salvation, of grace, of the essentials of Christianity. I believe you can get those from the top English translations. I believe it ultimately comes down to which Bible you are going to read because it doesn't matter how accurate the Bible is if you never pick it up to read it. It doesn't matter if there's a few flaws in wording. It doesn't matter if there's a couple of verses missing if you never pick up the Bible and read it. So if you will read the King James Version, great. Read it to your heart's desire. If you would read the Message Bible, good, great, read it. If you would read the NLT, NIV, whatever it is, pick the one you enjoy reading because you're gonna get more out of the one you enjoy reading than the one you just let sit there and collect dust. 
read the Bible. The Bible is an amazing, inspired book of God. We have so many talented translators, so many talented and hardworking teams that go into translating the original manuscript so that we can enjoy it in English. Pick one up and read it. If you want to decide which one you like best, you can do it. You don't have to go to the bookstore and pick up 10,000 Bibles. You can go on your phone, download the Bible app, and you can go pick through over 50 different English translations at your fingertips. Read them side by side. I like BibleGateway.com. I'll go read translations side by side. I can look at a verse in every single English translation with one click. Go. Read them, find the one you like best, buy yourself a Bible you love, whether it's a study Bible, a mom's Bible, a dad's Bible, a teen guy's Bible. Buy you one that you're gonna like, you're gonna read, and just read it. All right guys, as promised in the beginning, I'm gonna read to you John 3, 16 through 21 in I believe four or five of the top Bible translations so you can kind of compare them side by side. And as always, I'll have the scripture right down here so you can read along with me. All right guys, first up I'm gonna read John 3, 16 through 21 in my personal preference of translation, which is the NLT, and it is a thought for thought translation. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Next, I'm going to read John 3, 16 through 21 in the King James Version, which is a word for word translation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Next, we're reading John 3, 16 through 21 in the New International Version, which this one is a thought for thought translation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John 3, 16 through 21 in the English Standard Version, which is a word for word. However, it is a newer translation. It is a newer translation, but still word for word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And just for fun, I'm going to add one more. 
John 3, 16 through 21 in the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase and is probably on the far, far end of the paraphrase spectrum. But it is a version that I really enjoy reading just for understanding, provide clarity and provide a, a bigger picture, if you say. I, I study other translations, but as just for reading over the Bible, I do enjoy the Message Bible. This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son, and this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in Him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in Him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to Him. This is the crisis we are in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light, so the work can be seen for the God work it is. Now, as you can tell, the message translation is a whole lot different than any of the other translations we read, but I feel like it kind of adds another dimension to the understanding. I don't know that I would use it for study, but as for reading the Bible and getting just a whole picture painted of a passage, I think it's powerful. I think it's great. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. As you can see, we have a lot of fantastic translations. I ask that you leave me a comment down below. Tell me what your preferred translation is and what translation you want to buy in the future. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I release content just like this every single week. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let me know how much you enjoyed this video. All right, guys, keep living that bold life.